Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 228 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name is Barbara. I should say triathlete. Triathlete. Are you now considered a full triathlete? Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to show you my calendar so that you can appreciate the last six weeks of workouts. Twice a day, every day, almost. A couple days of rest, but yeah. It's either a bike, a run, a bike, a swim, a swim, a run, both, all three. Ugh. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> I definitely will consider myself triathlete. Thank you. Well, the countdown's on. We're in the month of the actual you know, triathlon. The countdown's on, I know. Do you check the weather at this point, or are you not there yet? No way, Jose. No. I'm not checking the weather. I don't even want to know how cold Lake Michigan is. I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> yeah. No. Shall we Google the temperature of Lake Michigan right now? Yeah, yeah go for it. I bet you it's probably 67. That's a guess. 67. See, I don't live there like you do. That so is I don't a know. chilly bath. <laughs> let me tell you. I'm actually doing it. I know you are. <laughs> 68 degrees. Not bad. Oh, my God. See, even in Florida, I know how cold it's going to be. <laughs> right. Is that wetsuit weather or no? You never wear a wetsuit. Yeah, that's right. You never do. Other I never people have, do. And I never will, but everybody else does. Well, there's a couple that don't, but... I mean, to try to take the damn thing off and put it on and swim with it and figure out how to even swim with it. I'd rather just be cold for a little while. It's not going to kill me. Yeah. So. Plus, nobody looks good in a wetsuit, let me tell you. <laughs> no. no. Uh-huh. Exactly. So, Barb, all this training, all this hard work, all this running and swimming and biking, it's for a reason, right? <laughs> yes, Elvis, it's for a reason. Are you going to plug some donations? You're doing it because of the Race for the Future 8.0. Now, this is yeah. now the eighth year the foundation has gotten a lot of crazy dental lab technicians together to do a triathlon. And this year, they're doing the Chicago Triathlon. It all raises money. Yep. So this money goes to grants and scholarships and education to technicians to make them, well, better technicians. Right. The best way to donate to Barb and her race is to head over to dentallabfoundation.org and hit the Donate Today button. It's right there in the upper right corner. Register, and you can actually select Race for the Future, and then you enter Barb Warner, or you can put in Voices from the Bench, and we can help Barb raise the most money she's ever raised. I think I'm there. I'm going. I'm getting there. I'm going to beat Sean Nowak. Sean Nowak. <laughs> <laughs> what is your record? Do you know your most raised? No. No. I was maybe close to 8K. I think I'm at about 75 now. Really? Maybe even more. We raised $500 today at Night Dental with Taco Friday. We asked everybody to donate $5 and people were donating 20 and 50. We, we raised $500. I'm so proud of my company. Nice. Great people. You didn't just sell one taco for $500? No. Everybody got two and we made homemade salsa and homemade guacamole and chips and rice. And it was a party. We had a great time. Who made all this food? My sister and Sharon. Sharon's my number one cheerleader. Oh, yeah. She'll be at the race this year. You'll meet her again. Oh, you've seen her. Yep. And someone gave her a cowbell. And I can't remember who it was. Sean Nowak's wife won and Sharon won. And she did it every time somebody paid today. Nice. I bet you there's a lot of ringing going on at Night Dental. There was a lot of damn ringing. <laughs> yeah. So everybody, let's head to this website, dentallabfoundation.org. And let's donate some money. I mean, sure, Barb and the race, but... Just overall, it's a good cause. It's provided so many opportunities to people in our industry to either get their CDT, yes, to get continuing education, yes. and just really help promote the greatness that is our industry. Yes, I agree. Doesn't matter. A dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars. I don't care. It all helps. Thank you. Shout out to Joe. Thank you, Joe, for your donation. Oh. And Kelly Wellicky, thank you for your donation. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Kristen Brown, my sis. 
Here's the promise. If you donate money and Barb knows about it, we'll do a huge name shout out next week. Yes. Let everyone know that you gave some money. And you know what? What? You know what you don't have to spend money on? Podcast shirts? No. (laughs) You're ruining my segue. (laughs) You don't have to spend money on another 3D printer. Oh my God, amazing. I know, that's right. This is the last week to get an entry in to win the $11,000 Asiga Max UV bundle from our good friends at Asiga North America. Damn, that's expensive. Eleven grand. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? Yes. You get it in an Asiga Max printer, a build tray, model resin, a t-shirt, and two hours of one-on-one training to make sure you get the most out of this amazing printer. Come on, guys. So if you win this printer, that's $11,000 you don't have to spend that you can donate to Barb in the foundation. (laughs) That wasn't my idea, guys. (laughs) Because that's what you do. When you get free stuff, you donate the money you would have spent. So head over to VoicesFromTheBench.com forward slash Asiga for your chance to win. It ends August 14th. So this is the last week. Don't be the person that says, oh, I should have entered because this is your last chance. Your last chance. Your last chance. Your last chance. That's a good echo. Thank you. So some of you might have heard an ad for an event done by ExoCAD that we've been playing on this podcast for the last few weeks. It's called ExoCAD Insights 2022. That is happening October 3rd to the 4th on the island of Malraco. How do you say that? Um, Malarca. 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 That's happening on an island off of Spain. See how I got out of saying that? (laughs) Totally did. That was good. Links to check it out are on this episode's show notes. The event sounds amazing, and we asked if we could have one of their featured speakers on the podcast. And this led us to Steve Campbell from the UK, an owner of the Nexus Dental Laboratory. Oh, well said. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, he's from the UK, so you have to say laboratory. Steve just happens to be the president of the Dental Lab Association in the UK and also an executive committee member of the British Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. Yeah. That's all fantastic and fancy, but the story of learning analog and now owning a fully digital lab, that's the best part. He talks about the history of dental technicians in the UK, going through his apprenticeship, getting into digital, and now getting on stage to advocate for more labs to go digital to appeal to the next generation of technicians. So join us as we chat with Steve Campbell. Whitmix introduces Veriguide OS, a Class 1 CE certified resin material developed for the production of high precision surgical guides for use in dental implant surgery. The new material is formulated for 3D printing systems, meaning the DLP, SLA, and LCD at both 385 nanometers and 405 nanometers. Veriguide OS has been successfully tested for biocompatibility and meets all mechanical property requirements. The resin features an easy post-processing method and produces highly accurate surgical guides with a high quality surface. Sleeves may be inserted directly after printing with excellent fit. Material can also be sterilized by autoclave, steam, ethylene oxide, or gamma rays without affecting the dimensional stability physical properties, and biocompatibility. For more information about Veriguide OS, visit Whitmix.com or call 1-800-626-5651. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. Voices from the Bench. The Interview asking for me to click okay so that was me that was oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> i didn't see it until i went back to it because i was sat looking at a different page well sometimes you have to be better than a technician to understand ah oh, hey there is nothing better than a technician <laughs> <laughs> no way all right we are excited today to welcome a guest all the way from the uk 
Steve Campbell from the Nexus Dental Laboratory. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm incredibly well, and I'm very excited to join you guys. Uh, you, I love the show. I think you're a breath of fresh air for the industry. So this, for me, is going to be a, a very good uh, a very good evening. Oh. Yes. Speaking of, it's like 7 o'clock at night there, isn't it? Yeah, it's 6 o'clock with us. Uh, obviously, we've got the, the time difference, the clock's uh, going uh, forward. So, yeah, we've uh, 6 o'clock here. So what is it, 1 o'clock for you guys? Yeah. 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 Uh, see, see, we've got through the day. You've got half the day still to go. I know. I, I was going to ask, know. how is the end of this day? Because I don't think it's ever going to end, but you're saying it's there. <laughs> well, it, it, it feels like we're there. You know, it never ends. If you're a technician, you tend to go from one thing to another, but the, the day is officially over at six o'clock. So, yeah, officially I'm off the clock. Awesome. So, Steve, you know how it is, man. We like to run every episode to kind of find out how you got into the industry. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, if I'm completely honest, by accident. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's the way a lot of it happens. You know, when someone says to you, what are you going to be? I never said, I'm going to be a dental technician because the honest truth is I didn't even know we existed. Uh, and that's part of where we are now as an industry. We're a, a, a hidden force doing good behind the scenes. So... I was at uh, school and I was always interested in engineering and my careers teacher said, I've got some something that I think you'll be interested in called dental engineering. Mm. Uh, never heard of it. Sent me for work experience at a dental laboratory and I don't know, I walked in, I was high as a kite from the acrylic and everything going on and I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> I walked out of that place and I was, I was, this is for me. This is what I'm going to do. I mean, we'll come on to it later, but completely different to what we do now. You know, when I walked into that lab, it was boiling pans of wax and, you know, wax being boiled out in the corner. Sure, there was, yeah. uh, there was the acrylic smell was everywhere. It was very hands-on, you know, bunts and burners. Oh, it was just nothing like we do now. So that came from your teacher? Yeah, strangely enough. Uh, my teacher, who was doing my careers, uh, a friend of his son was working in a dental laboratory. I was friends with somebody working in a dental laboratory. Um, so he'd just he'd come on his radar uh, and he looked at what I was doing, uh, saw I was good with my hands uh, and thought, this would be good for you. I think this is something you'd enjoy because I was always restless. I was always uh, very bad at focusing, <laughs> really bad attention <laughs> span, super, super poor. Uh, and he here. just said, look, I think this is for you. And he wasn't wrong. You know, I, I've got to thank him. Mr. Body, he was called. I'll thank him forever because he, he really, had it not been for him, this would this whole yeah. career would never have happened for me. Is this a quality we should be looking for when hiring dental technicians? The inability to focus? Yes. And stay <laughs> yeah. still? And... I think yeah, so. exactly. Look, I, are you hyperactive? Do you yep. have a problem with attention? <laughs> yes, come to us. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. That is myself and my son, who's a dental technician, and, and he said the same thing. You know, he's all over the place until he sits down at the bench and he just loves it. It's just the way it's, I think it's a lot of technicians I meet are exactly the same. We're busy people. We like to be into something. You know, it drives my wife insane. If we go on holiday, I can sit down for about five minutes and I'm like, okay, let's go see what there is to do here. And they're like, could you not just sit down? Could you just sit down for a minute? It's like, well, I have. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sold on it. So let's go find something. <laughs> But you mentioned that it was called dental engineering. Yeah. Is that common in the UK? Because we definitely don't refer to it here in the States. No, it isn't. I think what it was, it was a throwback to when you used to be called a dental mechanic in the early days. Oh, wow. So before the 40s, before they actually made it a profession as such, you, you were just classed as a dental mechanic and dental engineering. It was never really seen as dental technology until in the 40s it became, of course, it was dental technology. And that was when we had a big national drive to try and recruit as many technicians as possible to support all the surgeons that are out there because we have the NHS. They realized mm -hmm. that we just didn't have people to make these prostheses. So we had surgeons there, but there weren't enough technicians. So it was Oren Bevan who actually instigated that drive and yeah, it was super successful. You know, tens of thousands of people flocked to the industry. Really? When um, was this? Huge. That was, um, that was uh, 1948. 48? Wow. Yep. Okay. 48. Long time ago, yeah. Yeah, it was a long time ago now. But it was in place for a long, long time. You know, we set up a lot of dental schools. There was a high number of highly skilled individuals coming out. They were being trained 
both in the schools and the army, the air force, the navy yeah. also trained. And I think that's similar to the US. I think yeah. you guys can take that path in the US too. Yeah, yes. a lot of people yeah. do. Sure. Yeah. So and it was the same thing here, and and we had so many technicians. Like we had a really strong workforce in the UK. So who was driving this? The government? The government. It was, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was Oren Bevan. He was the Minister for Health. And basically, the government realized that we had a lot of dentists, but they looked at the, the way the dentists were being supported at that time and realized we've got a crisis. We, we will not have technicians to make these. Uh, so I think it was 1948 that the paper was, um, it was passed and they started this initiative. And that, that's when many, many, many dental schools all over the UK, Scotland, Wales, Ireland popped up and they started to produce, you know, really high caliber technicians. You know, some of the technicians that have trained me uh, are technicians who came from, from that training, uh, you know, and it's day, a very high standard, very exacting. That is super interesting. Elvis and I have done this podcast for many years and talked to a lot of folks, technicians from the UK, and we have never heard that. How the heck did you really? find out about that? Yeah, really? Uh, well, because, uh, well, I, I wear two hats. Uh, my other hat is I'm the president of the Dental Portraits Association. Okay. So I've really got to know my industry. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you're the one who's um, partly responsible, I work with an amazing board uh, and we have a great office. But if you're responsible for trying to, you know, make sure you negotiate the best possible path for the industry, you've kind of got to know where we came from. Uh, and understand where the challenges lie ahead. But that bit of history was actually uh, another lecturer from Manchester University, Chris, who very kindly sat me down and, and took me through the whole uh, history of it because I kind of came into it a bit like a, a bull in a china shop. And I was like, right, this is this is broken. How are we going to fix it? What are we going to do? And I was just pushing it. You know, we need more education. We need more engagement. Uh, and he took me to one side. He was like, do you know what, Steve? I think you might want to see this because it, it turned out everything I was saying had been done. It was a loop. We were just going back into no. it because at one point everyone knew it and then it sort of faded away and people didn't know it. And now we're sort of coming back to realizing just what we had really. Are you saying that it's true that it, those that don't understand history are doomed to repeat it? Do you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a line because it's true. It's absolutely there. You know, I ran in and he was like, this has been done. That's been done. This is what we did. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, I think sometimes it's really worth understanding your history. And under, at that point, it puts us in a strong position. We liaise with government bodies. So every time there's something comes up that might be a change in the law, because in the UK, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but we're grouped with other medical device manufacturers so we're also grouped with people who make hearing aids or oh. you know hip replacements so we've got to be careful because a lot of the rules that come in are, are very general and sweeping yeah um, and mm -hmm. not particularly well tailored to dental medical devices interesting yeah so you love that role then right because you're seeing some changes or you're you're about to make some changes yeah no i'm absolutely loving the role you know i um i, I came into it nearly seven years ago now when I came into it, it was a two-year term, um, but the chief dental officer changed her term to five years, so we changed mine to match, uh, just for continuity. Yeah. Uh, and then with all, everything that happened with COVID, uh, there was an oh, extension yeah. to her role, so I extended my role. But you know, the good thing about that is, uh, and that's thanks to the membership because they they vote you in or out. Yeah. Uh, it does mean that we have had with the team the continuity to actually get some long-term projects on the go uh, that we can hopefully push forward to, to really stimulate better engagement and we need recruitment and retention like nobody's business i'm sure you guys in america have the same problem i'm seeing it all over europe you know skilled technicians they're hard to get yeah yeah especially removable i'll tell you it we're they're just a dying breed unfortunately no disrespect but there's not a lot of youth you know in the united states especially coming into the removable it's, uh, we're yeah. Really yeah. And, and we're seeing that over here. And, you know, I saw an amazing uh, talk by Davide and uh, Chris from Ashley Burns Lab. They're prosthetics, you know, removables guys, mm -hmm. but they started to do it digitally. So one's very mm -hmm. traditional and the other one's Davide is very just all about digital and watching them do it and seeing how Davide was doing it. I thought, you know what? 
the tools you've got now, the way you work, your environment, I think it's going to be a change. I think it's going to go from being the not sexy part of, of dentistry to being really sexy again soon. You know, when everybody's producing these with, you know, full digital workflow and all the great materials that we see coming to the fore are really performing for them. It's not going to be like it used to be. You know, as I say, when I walked into that, that lab, and, you know, I could smell the acrylic and the, the <laughs> flask. These big brass flasks were being clamped down. And I loved that. Rubber mallets were being used. Yeah. 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 You know, it was really manual. But, you know, I get it. It's not really appealing for the guys that we see coming out of schools and colleges now. They've got different expectations of a workplace. They've got different expectations of the tools they want to work with, the environment they want to be in. So it may have hooked me, but I know it doesn't really hook them. Whereas seeing the way Davide works, I can see that that really would. You know, if, if I look at my children now going forward and they would come into it, I think they'd have an amazing future ahead of them because the tools there make it so that you use more of your, it's the skills you understand. You're using your brain, but letting the the tooling do a lot more of the, the manual labor. And there was an awful lot of, manual labor and removable so i oh, can absolutely. see why that that element has not been attractive for the longest time and, and i don't know about america but in the uk they weren't particularly well paid for that role either and i think that again doesn't really encourage people to to engage with it but it's a huge market and it's a, it's a really exciting time to work on that type of prosthesis as a lab yeah. we're just about to start to engage with it. We, we've never engaged with it up till this point. So you guys called CDTs, that means you're a certified dental technician, is that correct? Yes. yes. So when we call it a CDT, that's a clinical dental technician in the UK, which means you can work with the patient. Yes. So we, we have a CDT and we have people who can do removable prosthesis. We just never engaged with it because it didn't really fit with our lab. But now we're just about to start because it does fit with our lab. Yeah. You went to school for it. Where'd you go after you came out of school? No, see, this is the thing. I'm properly old school. I did the apprenticeship. Wow. So that, okay. that, that avenue's closed now. So I'm, uh, I'm an old boy. I actually went, I went to college to study computer sciences. So it came in very handy for where my role's taken me now. So Sure. Just took a while. <laughs> yeah, my, my nerdy tech brain is, is now being fed by something that, you know, I wasn't really into. It wasn't anything to do with what we were doing, you know, in the lab, you know, day to day when I was sure. waxing and casting and all the stuff that I'd learned uh, computer-wise was of no use to me, but it was something I just tinkered with in the background. So no, I did the apprenticeship. I worked constantly at the laboratory and I did it through the time served so that you could then at the end, you could submit all of your CV, the work you'd been doing, mm -hmm. and then you could get yourself onto the register that way. And I was probably one of the last few groups that managed that because that, that's no longer an option. You know, if you want to go now, you do go. You have to go to uh, dental school. Wow. So did you apprenticeship at a lab you were familiar with? or? Yeah. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, it was the one I was sent on work experience with. I, I went back um, after I was leaving because I was actually working. Um, I was working in an insurance office at the time. And I thought, this is boring. <laughs> it sounds no offense, boring. No offense to anybody who works in insurance. You know, it has its plus sides. But I was like, no, uh, this isn't for me. Um, so I, I went back and I just asked, hey, look, could I come back? You know, is there something I could do? Uh, and they took me on. And as I say, they took me on and they took me on an apprenticeship. And they worked me through. Um, so very much the old school way. They worked you through every department um, mm -hmm. so that you knew how to carry out every task. Then you'd have to go away and then you'd have to read books, learn about it yourself. You had to understand why things worked as well. And that's the one thing if I could go back, because, um, you know, we put all of our, all our trainees go through the dental school. Uh, and I, do, I think it's absolutely vital. You need to understand the material science. You really have to understand the physics uh, and mechanics of the things that we're doing, because everything we deal with, is going to be put under immense stress uh, and load. And you've got to understand why something may or may not work. And that's where elements of engineering come in because engineering was something I was always interested in. Yeah. So if I, you know, if I was to, to go again, I'd do it that way. I did it myself, but that's kind of doing it the hard way, really. You know, that's going on all the extra courses. And to be honest, I think 
this is one of the things I love about um, dental technology. I can name, going back through history, the John Wibleys, the Steve Taylors, the Ashley Burns, who had a massive impact on my career at what, some point or another by teaching me all about the things that I was missing. And I think that's what technicians do incredibly well. Uh, yeah. You know, we have good study groups. We have good courses. People have generally, I've found, uh, been very open and honest and willing to support yeah. each other, yeah. which, which I think is awesome. You know, I think that's just exactly what we need. It's a rarity. This is what I've learned through different industries that they don't always are as open and sharing as we are. No, not not at all. You know, I do see it's not everybody, but I'd say on the whole, the majority, we seem to have a bit of a, a brotherhood uh, and sisterhood where it's like, look, you know, come in. We know it's a hard job or, you know, it's, it's had its tough areas. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't see anybody worried about, or you might take my client, you might do this. All we're looking at at the moment is, look, guys, we're inundated with work. We just desperately need to help each other because we've got some big problems on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I see that only getting better now. I mean, things like your podcast, this this helps to engage people, spread the word, get information out there that might not be there. Uh, and going back, you know, it's not something you'd have expected. You know, when I first started, these weren't things, you know, there wasn't a podcast you know it's the, yeah. it, it, things like this just weren't there it's amazing how technology has has changed every aspect of our, our working and social lives around being a technician a segue into it do you own your own lab at this point yes uh, as of seven years ago so seven years ago um, i was a director in a, a bigger size laboratory but i decided i wanted to have a bit of a change and i was going to work just training people uh, in how to digitize. I was doing a lot of CAD work at the time. And then I was approached by a group of surgeons who said, look, don't leave, um, set up a lab and, and we'll send you work. So I had the chance to sit down and think, okay, if I'm going to do it now from scratch, what would I do differently? And the answer was everything. I, I started a completely <laughs> yeah. digital laboratory. I mean, it was that was the game changer for me. I was like, okay, no more waxing, no more casting, no more investing. All these long laborious tasks have to go because yeah. I knew if I was going to start again it would be lean and light and I started with myself and two other people and it, it just took off like a rocket because cutting out all of the really long laborsome tasks just freed us up to work um, and produce a lot more work um, and keep it to a high consistent level yeah and I think we were just lucky seven years ago was just about when in the UK selective laser melting had come out for copings we were still, you know instead of doing cast copings yeah a lot of the milling machines were getting up to speed a lot of the the cad it was just there i think if i tried it a couple of years before i don't think it was mature enough yeah we've seen digital go from being oh it's really exciting you know i'm going right back to when we had the first like you know dental wings scanners or some of the first cad we played with yeah, you know, Noble. It was it was relatively limited. You know, with the, the Noble Touch scanner, which went around and did a coping. You know, so <laughs> yeah. we've done we've done still all. Still had of to that. wax it. Yeah, yeah, you still had to wax it. Yeah, you still had yeah. to do all of that. You were just removing the processing element, but you still had to wax the thing and then put it on, and then do this uh, scan of the prep and scan of the coping. So it went through that phase, and then we all of a sudden seemed to just go into this real maturity phase where we've got some time to go. But now we're starting to see the materials actually come through to, to kind of match where the, the CAD tools are now. Because the CAD tools are, are running away with themselves. You know, Some of the things that we can do now with those things, it's just outstanding. Yeah. And it's now just a matter of, okay, are the materials going to be there to match what I can you know, produce? I can produce anything we want now in CAD. It's just, have we got the right materials that are going to function better than what we've already had yeah yeah so the lab you came from were they into digital or did you have to teach yourself to open up your own lab yeah not really it wasn't digital at that point it, it was i was doing quite a lot of digital at the time because i was doing um, a lot of digital cad abutments okay sure at that point i was on road shows training other technicians how to do it why it was better because this was at a time when everybody was still like we do stock abutments or we wax and cast. I'm not going to mess around with that cat. I don't need it. You know, yeah. why would you buy all of this when you can just buy this, do this, cast to it? It was a hard sell. It seems strange to say it now, but at that point, it, it was hard to change mindsets 
because, you know, people are in their comfort zone. They're doing it. They've been doing it well for years. So you're having to try to convince them that, no, this is going to be better for you. This is the way yeah. forward. Yeah. So, no, I, I when I started, I, I had to teach myself literally from the bootstraps because I hadn't done any of the other levels and detail of CAD that I, I got into. So it was just a case of sitting down and the way technicians do, it's like, okay, let's try this till I break it. <laughs> let's try again <laughs> and then try again and then try again. And eventually you just come up with some really good workflows and, you mm -hmm. know, it's definitely the right digital tools that are needed. You know, I'm not, I'm not here as like a plug and a segue, but um, I can honestly say when it really took a massive um, increase productivity for, for us was when we installed, put Ixacad in because we, sure. we had we had three three shape units and I spoke to a friend Ashley Byrne at the time and said look I'm going to get another CAD system and he said oh, you might want to try Exacad out and I was like uh, I don't know you know what it's like you, you, you know what you're using and I was like I'm not sure I'm okay with this and he was like look Steve come for me <laughs> yeah give, give it a go yeah. so I was like okay I'll give it a go and we started to find that yeah it was doing some things we started both it was doing some things better than three shape three shape was doing some things better than it yeah. Um, so we kind of stuck with it, and then it just started to evolve and evolve uh, to the point now where, you know, I've got eight Exacad units and still the same three three shape units because every time I bring someone into the team, we say to them, use whatever you like, and and they seem to just gravitate to the Exacad um, every single time. It's just something they they seem to find easier for the workflows that we have. That's not the first time we've heard that on the podcast either. We had a couple of texts, you know, just talking about the, the pros and cons of each of the systems. And yeah. they said the same thing and they reiterated what you said. Some of them do better on 3Shape and then the AxoCAD. But, the, you know, one of the thoughts on that particular podcast was that it was, in fact, superior in, in a lot of different areas. We're just getting into it in, in my laboratory now. Um, we had training a couple of weeks ago, so I'm definitely curious to pick your brain. Oh, hey, anytime, anytime. We've always, our policy's always been this. We've always had an open door policy. We let people team viewer in and we walk people through any stages or anything they've not done because I, I think that's what we're keen to do. You know, I'm lucky people gave me a lot of their time when mm -hmm. I was coming through and we're really keen that I, we want to get that back out to other, other laboratories because we see how much benefit it's brought us yeah. and we kind of know this is going to be the only solution to this technician sort shortage that we see, which is, I mean, huge. I mean, in the UK, we've gone from uh, seven and a half thousand technicians to five thousand technicians in sort of the last six, seven years. Sorry, is that mostly due to retirement or people leaving? Yeah, un unfortunately so. It's exactly okay. what it is. The average age of the UK technicians, 56. Wow. And the average lab owner is 58. So yeah. it is wholly and solely down to retirement so what we're seeing is in the next five years we're expecting to get down to two and a half thousand Jeez. because we unfortunately don't have really good training facilities anymore like we used to have we've got good facilities we just don't have the number of them you know there's we're yeah. down to four or five uh, for the whole of the uk wow. it, it's just crazy um because we're putting out i think last year there was 78 technicians joined the register but over 400 left. So yeah. we're not even leveling here. You know, we're still in the nosedive. So we've got to get these tools and use those to help the efficiency replace the loss of manpower. Yeah. So yeah. Is, is the government going to step in again, like in the 40s and say, we have a crisis or... Is this a different time? Do you know, this is interesting because this is exactly what we're in the, in the midst of with them right now. There's a, there's a big push, not just with the BLA, with the BDA, all the dental groups are pretty much hammering on the government's door and saying, look, you've got a crisis looming here. You will not be in a position to meet the needs of our you know, UK population if we don't take yeah. action now. So it almost feels like we're at that rallying call again. Uh, and it seems strange that we're looking back to, you know, to, to this information of the past. So I think there's two two elements to this. We do need the government to increase the training. But we also, I think we as technicians and laboratories, it would be great if we could go to more of the school's careers evenings and turn up with some of these great new tools we're using, some of these amazing digital workflow tools, you know, show them things like XCAD in action, 
show them the machinery they've worked with, show them the work's part of a global team. And I think we will then get the hook that they'll want to go there because the, the counter argument is they had the colleges open, they weren't fulfilling the numbers, therefore they were closing. So it's this chicken and egg situation we've got. You know, we have to drive people there to prove there is demand mm. and then hopefully we can you know bring them through. Well, you said so yourself. We got to make it sexy again. And, You've got uh, it. But it, but it is. I mean, you know, labs nothing are sexier great. than a three D printer. Let me tell you, <laughs> there's nothing. I, you know, people who come into the lab, they zoom over those milling machines, CAD screens. They're just glued to them because yep. I think it's fascinating. There's you're seeing these things just being created, or you know, reduced out of the disc, or being created out of the uh, the printing machines because. You know, we've got a fleet of those things and it's it's awesome. You know, people come in, you see their eyes light up. You know, we've had mm -hmm. a lad come in who's he's really interested in um, Formula One. He's studying aerodynamics and engineering. Uh, and he came into the lab and he was like, I didn't know you guys had such cool stuff. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No one knows. You know, we have really cool toys these days in dental laboratories. It's a great place to be. Yeah, you show someone that doesn't know what we do, just a simple scanner. They are just wowed that yeah. something could produce something that quick. And it is incredible. You've digitized it. There it is. And then right after yep. now we can manipulate it. Oh, and by the way, we can now print it. And and yep. it's just like, okay, this is cool. Yeah. There's so many elements about what we now do that we never did, which is incredible to me. I think what I'm lucky in one respect is I'm of the generation where I'm straddling both sides. I started wholly and solely in an analog environment. I remember stood with a, you know, a flaming torch, melting the alloy, <laughs> setting that thing spinning, just hoping it's not going to splash out at me. I've, I've done all of that hands on. And now I've come across to, to a fully digital flow. And I'm, I'm seeing that there's generations where there was the, the completely analog. There's the generation like myself, who have managed to straddle both. And then I see the, the technicians that are joining me now, they're only digital. So mm -hmm. in a way, I feel like we're really lucky if you're in that the, the group I've been lucky enough to be part of where I understand all the old skills. I understand exactly why we did it, how it works. And I think if we as a industry, if we can somehow carry that over as well, because there's so much value in that knowledge that will help people utilize these digital tools better yeah. because you know cad cam's amazing but it is still just a tool i, I used to pick yeah. up a wax knife now i pick up a mouse for me it's the same my brain is still challenged with the same problem when you looked at a, a big full arch on your on your bench or you're looking at a, a tricky case you're going through the same motions you're just mm -hmm. going to use a different tool to get your solution but it's always that it's, it's kind of like a Poirot moment, like, okay, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to make this work? Yeah. And, and you know, we work things out. I, I love technicians for problem solving. You mm -hmm. put a lot of technicians in a room, they solve problems quickly. They don't always ag agree, but they oh, solve problems. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't always have the same solution. <laughs> we've, so, you know, we've solved the problem in, in, in many different ways. <laughs> yeah. So at your lab and you bring people in, how do you train them? Do you have training protocols or do you set them down at a bench and over the shoulder? No, we mentor. So everybody gets paired with somebody in each department and then they'll spend six months to a year in that department and then they'll move mm -hmm. to a new mentor in another department. Wow. And we've got uh, Hugo Sousers with us. Um, he's a great technician. He, he went to Japan and studied the carving uh, carving yeah. blocks into teeth yep. we still yep. make our technicians do that he was on our podcast yeah, he was, was on your podcast he was yeah, on I was your like podcast that, i was like I that name that sounds story. familiar it is yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's familiar yeah, hugo he, he was there he got there before me i wasn't jealous <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know he was at your lab that's awesome yeah he is yeah he's a he's a super super guy and you know it seems strange when people say it to people but even our cat team, we make them do that course. We make them cut their fingers and, you know, carve down those teeth because yeah. you've got to understand what this thing is in, in three dimensions. Yeah. And then you can use these tools better. We don't let them just run off and let the machine propose something for them. They've got to know what it is they're driving this tool towards making for them. Well, that's where you, they're using their brain again. Exactly. Yep. So you still make your CAD and digital technicians still do the analog part 
and learn how to do it that way. Yep, they still learn how to carve them. They still sketch them. We still run those courses and then we, we don't just run it for ourselves. Last time we did it, we ran it and we had some spare places. So we just gifted them to, to some other people we knew because we were like, look, guys, for me, Hugo's courses are amazing. I, I think it's something that, you know, dentist technicians need to do because it's like when I learn, I think the reason I read teeth well, I think reasonably well. I'm sure other technicians would say I'm rubbish, but it's because I used to sit there waxing up for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. So if you're waxing or carving it, you're looking at that same thing, small details for such an extended period of time. You really get to understand it. And, you know, if you've done the, the PK Thomas technique, if you've done all the different occlusal techniques, you, you get to know it because you have to invest a lot of time and effort into making it. Whereas now digitally, it's easy to, for something to come up and I, I've seen it where someone's come to my lab and they've worked in other labs before, they've reasonably experienced and I'll ask them to make me something and then you look at it and you think, yeah, okay, it looks okay, but it, it doesn't look natural like the teeth around it. You know, yeah. what you've done is very much gone for a generic stock tooth here. Sure, yeah. I, I think that what that does with that course it focuses people really into looking at these fine detailed line angles and understanding how volumetrically it may be the same, but tweak those line angles a little bit and you've transformed the whole visual look of that tooth by playing with you know the reflection and refraction of light. So we still make them do it. And I say make them do it, do you know the feedback's always amazing. When they when after they finished, I was like, What do you think? Oh amazing, oh, I love it, it's great. So it's not like a burden for them to do it. It just helps us know, we know, they know what they're talking about when we let them loose with the, you know, with, with the Exacad. I want them to know what they're going to do. They understand what they're aiming for. They can read the teeth next to it. They can read the arch. They, they know what they're trying to make. And then they use that tool to do it a lot, lot quicker. That's great. My dad used to make everybody here sit down and play with wax or soap or any of those things that got them to understand all of those features in a tooth. And you're right, you know, you do, you still need to use your brain, even though you're on a computer and you've got something there that looks like a tooth, you can still change those line angles, the planes, the texture. There's just so much we can do as technicians still. A hundred percent. You know, this is the, the, what, when we chat to our team, we're like, look, you and every other technician can, can make a tooth. You're, you're only going to stand out by probably that last five or 10% you can add to yours. And it's only when you understand exactly what you mentioned there, Barbara, with the, it's the fine understanding of line angles, details, texture, and all of a sudden it just looks natural, you know, or it works with what's around it because I think you understand what it was you were trying to replicate. Uh, and that's actually one of the entry tests to go to dental school here. They still make you, you know, with carve it out of uh, blocks of soap or, or make it with um, and putty or, or waxes. They, they want to see what your what your motor skills are like. You know, mm. can you make something with your hands, even yeah. though realistically, when they finished, there's very little chance they're going to be doing the kind of tasks that we used to do. They won't be working with those fine motor skills anymore in the same way. They will be working with digital tools. Yeah. Do you think as an industry, we have to get to the point where we can teach all this digitally? Or do you still think we'll always need that carbon soap? wood whatever hands-on it's like anything when we're looking at digital's exponential growth so it's it's hard for us because we've only had linear growth in our industry you know every evolution has been quite slow i remember i went from a bunsen burner to an electric wax knife and it was like wow you know <laughs> it's just an evolution of the same thing and i even got one that you loaded little wax cartridges into push the button it would dose just the right amount through the end of the the wax knife uh, honestly, this was, for me, this was like Star Trek science. And, yeah. <laughs> and all we were doing was really just slowly evolving the same tool. Whereas now with digital, for example, the, the latest version of Rake that just came out with Exacad, it's now got fully automated model builders. It's now got different features that actually show you areas on the tooth where it's going to move and manipulate. So I think actually we will be able to teach it full digitally two or three years time. Uh, mm. Because it's like anything, I think... There's always still going to be a value in what we do with the, the, the carving courses and the, the sketching courses and the, the anatomy courses. But yeah, I'm sure that we could teach people 
in a fully digital workflow in, in the next few years, we'll just learn how to better teach people using that tool. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I just find it trickier for me because I'm very hands-on as all technicians I've met are. So I get it in my hands and I, then I kind of really get it. You know, people can explain things to me, for, you know, for hours and I just put it in my hands and let me have a play with it. Okay. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I get how this works now. We're, we're good. I think that's just part of my era. So it would be naive of me to say, oh, no, 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 we'll never be able to do it fully digitally. I think that's going to come. I think we need to, honestly. Yeah, look, because it's scalability as well. I mean, I don't know what the market's like in America for your recruitment um, and retention in, in technicians. If it's any even a fraction as bad as we've got in the UK, yeah. we've got a, we've got a real mountain to climb here. So we've got to find ways to do this as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. So, and, and that, for me, is these digital tools. It's absolutely the same here. Big time. There's a major issue. Yep. And finding good quality people that we can train yep. is the problem. But even the lab I was at, we had designers that never hand waxed, never carved. And wow. that's a mindset that we're going to have to, I believe, teach them. In that same format without having to say, here's a knife, don't cut a finger, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we did go through some plasters on uh, on Hugo's courses. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, there, there was a lot of cut fingers. So you mentioned earlier, you let your technicians decide if they want to use 3Shape or ExoCAD? Yep. You know, we've had technicians who've come in from, uh, Magda's our most recent one, who classically is ceramist, who had 3Shape experience. And we came in and I just said, look, you know, because my philosophy has always been with my team. I'm really if if you know what tools are going to get you the best result and I'm happy with that result, you can have those tools. I don't care how you get there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because we all work in different ways. Like you said earlier, get us in a room, we'll fix a problem. We might fix it different ways. And I've found in my time that it's been a lot better, more productive for me to actually say to people, do you know what? I'm just going to let you use what you want. And then what what we did is in the room, there's a mix of people on 3Shape or EXO, and they could see what people were doing on the EXO. And then it got to the point where Magda was like, you know, I just want to have a go with that. Cause I just, I keep getting stuck here on this one. So I want to have a go on that one and then started using it. And then probably a month later, uh, she was not using three shape at all. And I was like, are you, are you not using the three? She was like, no, 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 no. I, I just found this now, this works for me. This is a much better workflow. I get what's going on. Um, and, and she wasn't getting like errors and frustrations. So we were like, okay, there we go. If you force someone to do something, you're never really getting them on board. They might kind of begrudge it. So I've always been, yeah. I've been like, look, if, if you genuinely think you're, better and more productive on three shape then by all means use it because some of our technicians actually are you know they're just so used to doing a certain task in a certain way that i'm just happy to let them do what they do but because we've got really complex tasks on the go and we've got a lot of complex cases with a lot of projects that we we need to share in and out of not just our lab we've got a partner lab in tenerife thomas telfer uh, is over there so we can use Dental Share to just share the project directly to him. And he opens it and he carries on, finishes oh, and wow. sends it back. And our team just produce it for the surgery in London. And that, for me, is a game changer because we've got rid of the geographic restrictions. Because, you know, we're in the UK and, you know, we're tiny compared to the US. But Ripon, where I am, it literally is. It, it's called the city, but only because we've got a cathedral. It's smaller than most villages you guys have ever probably <laughs> driven through. <laughs> You can drive through it in a couple of minutes and miss it. <laughs> so for me, it's it's really important that I can work with people regardless of where I am geographically. I need to be able to cherry pick and get the best teamwork and services wherever it is in the world. And that's kind of what that did for me. Uh, and I think they realized that as well because it's that collaboration element that means all of a sudden, okay, I can just take that project, zip it, well, send it in dental share, they open it, carry on, send it back. We're all updated on the same bit. We're not coming in and out of softwares. Um, so it gave us a real it gave us a real edge. And I think the team, when I look at them, they just have they've just gravitated that way themselves. Uh, and, and I think that's often a good indicator if something's really working in your lab. 
if the Hell team yeah. wants to use it, yeah. it's probably a good a good test. <laughs> you know what? That, that must be good. <laughs> that dental share, that's for ExoCAD. Because three shape, you'd have to export and then yeah. re-import it. Yeah, that's huge. It is huge because you literally just click on it. You click um, the dental share button and you click you want to collaborate. They get an update. They do it. And then when it comes back, you, you can just see a little update in the bottom left tells you they've received it, they've opened it, they've worked on it, and it's ready for you again. And we use that with our clients as well because they do Exaplan, then we just design the immediate loads for them. Because what we're trying to do is avoid the downtime. We used to try and help them by starting to pre-plan some of the implants, but only surgeons are allowed to you know, sign it off and do the final movements. And we were like, actually, why don't you just have Exaplan? You do it, just dental share it to us we'll import it and we're away. And and that just made it so slick and efficient, not just for us, for the, the surgeries. They were really happy with that because it just made it a, a smooth workflow both ways. Yeah. That's a huge benefit. So are, yeah, you, are, you, are you physically, once these cases are going through your laboratory and everything gets designed and approved, are you still actually physically on the bench as well as the design part of it? Yeah. I'm. Um, so my role is I'm just... CAD all day, all day, to like every all day, every day. Um, so with everything else I'm doing, uh, with running the lab, I, I, they will, you'll always find me in the CAD room because I'm pretty much always working on the things we're doing now or any of the new projects that are coming through. Because we work on some beta testing projects with a, a few different companies around the world. Wow. One of which was Elos. Actually, I met them at the uh, the first XCAD Insights meeting, uh, and we were showing them some of the things they were doing, and then they asked us to come in, but you'll find me every day in with the CAD team because that's where I love to be. I mean, it it really, for me, is the, the most enjoyable bit. I wish I was a good enough ceramist to be able to sit and, and finish in detail. Mm-hmm. I'm not that guy. I don't have that eye. But luckily, I've got great technicians like, you know, Hugo, Mark, Nikku, uh, Emma and Claire who, t- who take care of all of that for us. Cool. Know your strengths. Yes, exactly. And your weaknesses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose it was a natural progression for me because I went naturally towards CAD because I'd spent all of my dental career basically doing all of the preparation, the frameworks, the design in the very manual, laborious way. You know, the way that when you cast a full arch implant bridge framework and it didn't oh. fit. You, yeah. you cried for the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas now I just design it and it gets milled and it comes back and it fits. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a game changer in uh, in in stress levels. I mean, there's other stress levels, of course, because we're we're technicians, but but not the same stress levels as when you used to you'd pray to the casting gods that your your work would fit. Um, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> I remember those days. I gotta say, that's funny. And we called him the casting gods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Has that ring broken? Are we okay? Oh, we're okay. Okay, now we cast the alloy. Nobody move. Don't, don't quench it. Let it cool naturally. Shut the window. <laughs> Shut the window. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, this, these are all the fine arts that these uh, these young guys coming through are missing out on. You know, after, uh, all, the, all these young trainees, they don't know these fine arts. They complain about breaking a burr, and you're like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't know pain. <laughs> So, Steve, you, you own a lab. You're president of the association. Do you get into public speaking? Do you do any of that? Yeah, I do. A lot of what we were doing was is trying to spread the message about our issue and, and try yeah. and engage uh, to get more people in. So we do quite a lot of uh, traveling and talking for, for different groups. Most of it is actually on this trying to digitize everybody that's my number one drive at the moment yeah recruitment retention is is the biggie but the number one go-to that will help us in the shortest term if i can take all of the labs that are not currently even partially digitized who haven't seen the benefit it could it could bring to them I, i we could solve a problem really quite quickly here because there's there's so much labor time that they're they're not actually making the most out of by just digitizing those processes away. So I think that's pretty much why I'm doing this and why I'm doing the Insights Talk is because we've got to get the message out there. It's like there are some amazing benefits to digitizing. Don't feel you've got to go the whole hog. You know, you could, even if you just started with one step, digitizing one process, you might find, oh, hold up, I've got a little bit more resource, you know, in, in technician time left here and we can reskill them into something else because 
you know, we need a short term fix while we wait for the longer term, which will be the new sort of drive for recruitment and retention to come through. Yeah. We, we've got to do what's the quickest thing we can do now. Well, I can't get any more people. I, I can tell you that for nothing. And I'm, we are never not advertising for technicians at our lab. And the same story goes for every technician lab owner I spoke to in the UK. We're always, always, always on the lookout for someone new. Oh, sure. Yeah. And so we're not fixing the problem that way. So we're always looking at like, okay, is there something we could be doing better than we're doing now? And and in honesty, that was the whole reason we'd never got into removables because I just looked at it and I looked at the guys that I had and I was like, I can see it's going to swallow up so much of your time until we're ready. I don't see see the point in us doing it. And and I've seen the CAD systems have got really good at dentures now. And we just were a bit held back by the materials. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I'm not here to plug any materials. I went to Charlotte earlier this year Mm -hmm. and I uh, met um, Anne, a technician there, who's using a material called Flexera. Yeah. And there was also the other one from Lucitone from Dentsply. Both of those really impressed me because it's the first time I've seen denture bases that actually seemed strong and robust. All the other ones we tried in the UK, they just weren't there. You talking about Anne Colzer? Yes, I am. Yeah, she's been on the podcast too. Yep. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know she'd been on. Yeah, that's hilarious. That's cool. She's awesome. But you know, this goes back to this thing about people being helpful. And I was just chatting away to her about it, and then literally two weeks later, I open a package at my lab. There's a denture, uh, and she just <laughs> she just made me one and sent it across, and I was like, "How incredible is this?" Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> I love our industry, man. You guys are getting all the best people on your show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for bringing the, the level down, but hey. Oh, not at all. <laughs> That's great. But that, that for me, is that this is it. I think, you know, I, I'd say we're only on Gen 2 of these materials, yeah. you know, on the dench side. Once Gen 3 and Gen 4 hit, you know, I think we've got this wrapped up. So I think it's now is the time to get stuck into that because as I say, you know, um, when I look at Davide and Chris, the work they can do together by combining the old traditional skills and his new digital flow, they're really knocking it out of the park. And in an environment, you know, you're sat in a design studio with a computer and it's it's great. You're not doing the, much of the, the manual processing that's really quite time consuming. Mm. You know, there's a lot of gypsum you go through in those flats. You know, you're, you're breaking those things out. They're absolutely everywhere. Whereas these processes, it's clean. I got to say real quick, I was at a lab last week and this guy was in there by himself doing some good stuff. But he told me he spent two hours to adjust stock abutments for a three unit case. Ugh, no. I was like, why, why are you still doing this? <laughs> this uh, I'm with you completely. You know, we have this conversation so often. And, and, and you know, this comes back to this is definitely in the UK. In the UK, when we looked at everything, we looked at the cost of components and the cost of stuff. But, you know, we were terrible at looking at our cost as yeah, a technician, time. our yeah. hours, our time. You know, the hours that some of my technician friends and myself used to work were obscene. And I, I, th- I, know, I know it's the same in America. You know, it wasn't unknown for people to be easily doing 14, 15, 16 hour days and not flinching. You know, people were kind of proud of like the hours they were putting in. Yeah. Whereas now we're like, no, that's not the trick, really. Yeah. Not healthy. You know, to be successful, <laughs> it's not healthy. It's not good for, for you. It's not good for anyone around you. I think the trick is know and understand the value of your time because if you did you'd never spend two hours modifying two stock abutments yeah but i can knock two abutments off in cad in 10 minutes yeah if you look at the volume and, and scalability there you know that one that one technician they could be doing a lot more work and actually getting a lot more time back for themselves and then they get to the point where they choose their balance do they want to actually i can now do enough work and still have enough extra spare time for myself or i can still work as much but actually my productivity is going to go up three or four times yeah you know Uh, it gives you it gives you the leeway to choose where you're going to go but you know god man i used to be tied to a milling machine for years you know the old breed at milling machines my fingers (laughs) at the end of the day (laughs) milling around around those abutments especially we had a few on it or polishing gold crowns Yeah. I had no thumbprint for years, <laughs> polishing gold crowns. Yeah. People were like, why have you got shiny fingers, oh, gold crowns? So That's hot. why. <laughs> yeah. Say no more. Not fun. 
Yeah, it's not fun. We all know it. Yeah. I think we're going to get in trouble if we don't start talking about a meeting that's coming up in Spain. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, but okay. What's this all about? How does a guy from the UK end up speaking in Spain? Yeah, do you know, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> good uh, answer. I, I think they must, have, they must have looked through all the names of people who were good, then people who were available, and then just came <laughs> to me at the end. Uh, because, I don't um, believe that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think we were lucky enough that I think some of the team from XCAD saw the talks we were doing, how we were using the tools, kind of our message to the industry was, guys, digitizing and get on this. And I was very lucky. I went to the first XKid Insights uh, in Darmstadt. And that's when I met um, the guys from ELOS. You know, they've got a huge trade hall there. I met the ELOS guys there. I met loads loads of 3D printing company guys mm-hmm. there. Wacom. Still struggling to get out on board with that whole, you know, pen and pad thing. But these are all the guys that I met. And one thing that struck me when I was there, it had a real... A bit like I feel the industry's got now. It had a real kind of supportive group feel about it. There's a community in that. Yeah. And it was people who were really trying to drive forward on different pathways. And when they came to me and said, look, Steve, uh, we've got an opportunity for you to, to talk here, you know, because my, my story is, look, why we digitized. With, when it started with a, a lab and it was completely digital, that was seven years ago, and there was only uh, three of us at that point, and now we're we're just broaching on 27. Wow. It's been rapid. We couldn't have done that without this workflow. And that was kind of the story that I'm trying to, to, to share, which is like, look, guys, there's nothing big and clever about this. It's really simple, and we can all do it, and we have to do it. I think that's more my, my message is going to be uh, at the meeting is we need – as an industry to digitize and we need to encourage everyone else we know and support them in making that, that sort of transformation over. And I was to say in the past, it's always been in Germany. And then this year it's in Mallorca. I, I was never going to say no. I was like, <laughs> count me in. I mean, it, it was an honor to be asked, but then yeah. you tell me that we're, you know, we're going to be in Mallorca. Well, yes, I'll be there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's the 3rd and 4th of October this year. Has Sasha Hine ever been on your show? Who? Sasha Hine. He's the guy who did sort of worked with the group that worked on eLab and a few no. other things. No, we've never had him. Oh, you've got to get Sasha on. The guy's a genius. What he doesn't know about shades, uh, you know, not worth knowing. Then you've got Waldo, Dr. Golshan, my guy. There's a load of great people going to be there mm-hmm. um, sharing. It's exactly the same thing. They're sharing their workflow, how it works for them, how it helps them collaborate with the surgeon. But I think when you do it at Insights, it's slightly different from going to a normal meeting because what is unique about Insights is all of the Exacad team are there. So they have an expert section. So you can turn up with, hey, do you know what? I was trying to do this with my system. It was driving me up the wall. I couldn't work out how to do it. They can actually sit down and show you going through how to do it. You, know, oh, you can wow. actually take with them, you know, SDR a case. And I think that's really powerful because it's hard when you first do it to all often know exactly where to go. Yeah. You know. Where do I go next? What do I choose? How do I get to there? And then, you know, to have the experts there, the people who actually make the program just is incredible, really. And, and the fact they make themselves so openly available for me is, is what's different from any other meeting I've been to. It's not often you can go straight up to the people who are programming these things and say, do you know what would be a really handy feature? This would be great. It doesn't do this. And then they might actually surprise you by saying, oh, it does. You just do this, then this. Wow. So um, I think that's what's good about it. It's it's a very active, hands-on type affair. Nice. Was it last year or the year before they had it in Germany? It was the first one was uh, in Darmstadt. They had it last year as well, as well but it was um, COVID. Yeah. It was still quite heavily under um, COVID precautions. Sure. Yeah. So we chose at that point, we had to, we did the video in option. Yep. Um, because they did that for that year. Um, but we went, it said, went to the first one. And then last year it was, um, I say, it just wasn't, travel was not anywhere near as easy. Yeah. As slowly coming back to being. Yeah, for sure. But the first one, was it pretty well attended? Yeah, it was really well attended. Nice. Um, it was busy. As I say, what kind of, I think it surprised me because it was their first one. I didn't mm-hmm. expect it to be as big as it was. You know, I, I expected it to be a little bit smaller, not so much going on. But, you know, they had some a lot going on. It was actually when they unveiled, their, they signed on, on the stage their exo plan. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, they'd release that for the surgeons. And that again, that's been a real productivity increase for us, having our surgeons do that element. If that's one thing that I would always say, go to the event because it's like anything. You know, when you always get the feeling that a company's, they've got something in the wings. They, they're going to want to tell you about it. They yeah, tend to yeah, want to yeah. save it for that moment oh, yeah. where you can be there because there's so many really, really good, like, and when I say good, I'm talking more from an efficiency point of view. Features in the, the, the latest one, we just you know, installed it. And I say it's got an automated model builder now. Well, that's great. I click a button, it's doing that, and I can go do another task. Whereas in the past, I was sat there clicking the next stage, then the next stage, then the next stage. So there's just these refinements coming through that are just going to make things that little bit slicker, I think. So give it up. Do you know the big announcement they're going to make? Can you spill the no, beans right No, because nobody here? trusts me with any secrets. <laughs> and look, I've got, I've got a reputation. I, I am terrible with secrets, so That's nobody so trusts I. me with anything. <laughs> We're not so going to tell I anybody. Know. Come on. I'll, I'll edit this part out. It's not like you've got a huge listenership. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Don't tell him. He'll tell everybody. That's kind of me and Elvis. Am I uh, just saying? Uh, hey, look, this is, it is me. I think everyone's like, look, he gets too excited. Don't tell him. He's only going to get excited and tell people. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, that's great, Steve. What a great conversation, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, honestly, I, I really genuinely mean it. When that, the opportunity came up to, to, to come on the show, I, I couldn't say yes quick enough. I was like, yes. <laughs> they were like, oh, you know, I've, I've seen you some information across. I know who they are. I want to be on. <laughs> thank you. That's fantastic. And, and thank you for coming on and yep. just telling the story, giving the UK perspective. It's I'll amazing. tell you what I need to know. I need to know, like your social media posts are the most on point I have ever seen. <laughs> Which one of you two? Are you, is it a joint effort? Oh, it's Elvis. Some He's of the images fun. you choose and the lines are just <laughs> awesome. No, that's, that's sadly on me. <laughs> Well done, because you are just nailing it. <laughs> Everything you can relate to it immediately. It's just oh, yeah. that, like, yep, know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. In there, done that. <laughs> uh, well, at least I've had the opportunity to thank you in person, then, because it's absolutely fantastic. No, I appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks for listening and tuning in. And you're now one of the members. One of the members. I've made it. I'm, I'm now. I can walk in and say, Hugo. You're not so special. I've been on. I'm as special as you now. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much, you. Steve. Appreciate you. You know, one of these days I'm going to run into you. Oh, I really hope you do. Uh, I really hope you do. I'll, I'll let you know next time I'm coming over to the US. Hopefully we'll meet up at some event together. But um, I will ah. definitely, definitely love to, to catch up with you guys, get you both a drink. Let's go to awesome. Spain. Just there you go. This. Podcast live from Spain. <laughs> yep. Wink, oh, wink. Hey, guys, you, you should be there. I know. <laughs> well, the I'm bench thinking. needs to be at Mallorca, surely. Live from the beach. I'll look in. Live from the beach. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and then you'll find out exactly what the big announcement is. Exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll spill it 30 seconds after it happens. <laughs> All right, Steve. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Oh, hey, that, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have you unlocked your dental laboratory's potential through 3D printing? Well, with the Asiga, you can. Did you know Asiga has over 500 validated materials on their open material system, and it's growing every day? By harnessing Asiga's proprietary layer monitoring technology with its smart positioning system and its integrated internal radiometer, as a laboratory, you'll be able to produce any indication you desire. It doesn't care if you need models, splints, temporaries, or heck, even permanent crowns. Your investment will be future-proof with the Sega's rugged engineering, providing you with a fast, accurate, and repeatable machine with a reputation that is time-tested in the dental laboratory industry. If you'd like to learn more about the Sega's machine or the material offerings, please visit the website at asiga.com. That's A-S-I-G-A dot com. Or contact your favorite dental reseller. And we appreciate your support of the podcast, Asiga.
big, huge thanks to Steve for coming on our podcast and telling us all about the dental laboratories in the UK. Nice. Did I say that right, Elvis? Laboratories. Right. Well, it's sad to hear that you share a lot of the same issues that we have here in the States. It sounds like we can learn a lot from each other as we overcome them. If you want to see Steve on stage and also a bunch of other really smart, passionate dental technicians, head over to exocad.com forward slash insights 2022 to see an amazing, amazing event, which I know Elvis and I kind of wanted to go to. <laughs> An island that neither Elvis nor I can pronounce. It's Malorca, Malorca, something like that. Malro? A- yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you don't. It's a super great meeting for all of you Exocad fans. Why not turn an amazing education and event into amazing vacation? Oh my God, that's such a good idea. <sighs> So thanks again, Steve. Awesome. We appreciate you. And we will talk to you next week. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Bye. I'm just looking at getting myself prepared here. We're going to try to get you some money. We can talk about your tacos.